Don Perignon. 63, it's a good vintage. Oh no, thanks. It's uh, always important to rely on the kindness of strangers. John Reed. Alton. I know it all seems a bit overwhelming at first, but uh, something makes me think you'll get used to it. In fact, I predict you could be the best-selling artist in America if you desire. I see you like the song, then. Not quite as much as the singer. That's a clip from Rocket Man. I'm delighted to say that Taron Egerton is back on the show. Hello, Taron. How are you? I'm very well. It's lovely to see you again, Simon. Are you, are you enjoying all this? Because this is quite some bum fight, isn't it? It's demanding and very energetic experience promoting a film always. But there is something galvanising about having pride in the project. And I have pride in the project. Yeah. And a number of people have said, you know, this is a real kind of breakout role for you. Does it feel... I mean, you've had really high-profile roles before, and we've spoken to you about those, but, you know, does this feel of a different order? In some respects, of course it does. I would be lying if I said it didn't, because it's about someone globally recognisable. But beyond that, the process has felt very creative and collaborative, and I've loved the people who've worked on it. And I genuinely have great faith in all of them and their specialist skills. And when it all comes together, I believe in the movie. So I'm, um, I'm very excited to be talking about it. But I am going to reserve judgment on quite how it's going to affect my life until it's at least come out in one territory. <laughs> okay. I did what I think most people will do when they come out. And I had a blast. I thought it was terrific. And I just downloaded a whole bunch of Elton songs which, as well as the soundtrack with you singing, uh, because I thought I had them and then I didn't have them, you know, because you forget the genius of the writing skills of Elton John and Bernie Bernie Taupin. So it's directed by Dexter Fletcher, you've worked with before. Can you explain how the jigsaw came together of you being Elton came about? So we were doing Kingsman 2 and I think Matthew Vaughan struck up something of a friendship with Elton John and David Furnish, who have had this project for over a decade in development with Lee Hall, the scriptwriter. And Matthew had found out that I could sing and as you know, the film is a musical. And I think his architect's mind started ticking and he obviously approached them first and then asked me how I felt about it. And I thought it was incredibly exciting and he said that he had Dexter in mind to direct it. Dexter and I had this fab time making a movie called Eddie the Eagle with Hugh Jackman. And it just felt right. And it felt like an unmissable opportunity. And then it kind of sat there for a couple of years with lots of conversations happening and and very little actually moving forward until late 2017, where it started to really feel like something that was going to become a reality. And then by mid-2018, we were rocking and rolling. At the start of 2018, we went to Abbey Road and recorded me performing two songs by a piano, not playing a piano, but by a piano. And I sang your song and Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. And we did that basically to try and get the studio support we needed and Paramount became involved after that point and everything started to really accelerate. Because it's not just Elton being in the Kingsman movie, but it's also the fact that you sang I'm Still Standing in Sing. Yes, that, that happened. And also your RADA audition, I understand, was your song. This is true. Very so true. the Elton influence, even though you're way too young to be a part of the Elton story from the 70s. Which of course. Is the period of, but he's been a part of your life anyway. But I think that's the case for a lot of people. It sounds like fate, and it sounds like an extraordinary level of synchronicity, but actually, for most people, we can chart points in our lives from Elton's music. That's the nature of these global phenomena. Uh, they do form the soundtrack to our lives, and it's why people feel such a sense of global ownership. And I'm, I am no exception. You know, I've, Elton's someone I've been aware of from a very, very young age. Yeah. Can I ask you about becoming Elton? Whether there was, uh, I don't know, whether it's the way he walks, the way he sings, the way he holds himself. Is there something when it clicked? I think it's about a duality of extremely kind of ferocious expression and massive levels of energy and then an extremely vulnerable sensitivity. And it's about oscillating between the two, I think. I'm not a great impersonator. I don't think it's my particular skill set. However, I have sought to capture something of the spirit of who he is and knowing him a little bit, that to me is about that thing he has where one minute he can seem hugely imposing and intimidating and the next he can look like a little boy. And that's who he is in my mind and that's sort of what I've tried to bring to my performance. I've interviewed him a a number of times and it's fair enough to say it's not an impersonation. But There are you, elements, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Abso- I'm not going to deny absolutely. that. But, but, and, but also he has a very distinctive singing style. His yeah. diction is really 
unique. I mean, it's quite mangled. It, it is, it times. is. And one of the challenges of this is it's changed so much over the course of his life. You know, one of his contemporaries is Michael Caine and the same things happen to him. That's what happens as you get older. Because of the nature of what our movie is stylistically, we don't deal with the songs chronologically. That presents a very unique challenge because Elton's voice when he was 23 is wildly different to his voice of, say, the late 90s. But it might be that a song from the late 90s is included in the first act of the movie and a song that he wrote when he was 23 is included in the last. So essentially, it's about trying to find moments to pay homage to and be evocative of without being locked down by a very specific chronology because the nature of what our movie is doesn't really allow for that. I've heard you describe the movie and the style of the movie because obviously it's not told like Bohemian Rhapsody is told. This is a, a different approach. There's part jukebox musical yeah. in there. Uh, someone described it as a rehab confessional. I mean, how, <laughs> what, are the, like what phrases are you happy with? I'm quite happy with that one. I like that. And I think, you know, in some respects, it's a few different things. And, and of course, we're not trying to distance ourselves from Bohemian Rhapsody, there are elements of it that are similar. There are elements of it that are nearer to a more conventional biopic, but we do depart from that at times. We use Elton's songs to try and progress the plot, and we try and take some of these lyrics, lots of them being quite prosaic, and attach meaning to them that suits our purpose. So when Elton leaves rehab, he turns to the group and he says, I found a taste of love in a simple way. And it's not hard to know what message we're trying to convey there. But... Um, I am very comfortable with what anyone wants to take from it. I hope, I think the best work is open to interpretation. And I do feel that way about our film. I mean, I love Bohemian Rhapsody as well. But one thing it was criticised for was sort of looking away from Freddie's sexuality. Mm. And that's not something which is going to be labelled mm. at your film. You absolutely embrace it from the word go. It's really part of the picture. I'm glad you feel that way. I think the thing with Bohemian Rhapsody is it's as much a movie about the band as it is him and it's aimed at a very specific audience. Now, we are lucky enough to be working with Elton and David as producers on the film, and it's a slightly more grown-up story, I would say. It's certainly a more grown-up telling of this story, and it was always at the forefront of what we wanted to achieve. I feel it's important. It was always in the script. It's not something that we as filmmakers have rode in on our charges and insisted on. It was always in the script. It was in the script that was developed, and it was part of what excited us about it, and we've tackled it in the way we would anything else. Yeah, and you and Elton and David Furnish have said basically, if that means that we don't get shown in Russia or it gets banned in... i yeah. in, OK, sorry, I'm quoting yourself back uh, yeah, at you. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, then so be it, because this is the movie that Elton wanted. Yes, exactly, and all of us. And I think making concessions about those key things do not lead to change. And so somewhere you have to draw the line. And of course, of course, this is a commercial endeavour as well as an artistic one. There has to be a point where you preserve your integrity in order to be able to look, one, yourself in the eye, in the mirror, and two, the gay people in your life you love and care about. How much were Elton and David part of the creative process? Once you'd been wound up and you were on and the film is running and you're yeah. making it, does he visit the set? David and, did. Yeah. Elton didn't. And I'm very grateful that he didn't come to set. I think when you're portraying someone's struggle with addiction, especially, you know, you have to have the freedom to move around in a way that possibly makes someone look a little unappealing at times and possibly makes someone a difficult character to invest in at times. That would have been very, very difficult had Elton been around. So I was grateful to him for giving me that space. That's not to say we weren't connected during the process. We were and still are very connected. But um, David came and just because he wasn't there, that doesn't mean that they weren't watching lots of rushes and having input and, and feelings about things. But no, they weren't breathing down our necks. That, you know, I think Elton understands creativity and he's a big fan of film. And, you know, anyone worth their salt knows that in order to get the best out of people, you have to afford them space. There's absolutely no question that the film does not glorify drug taking. There's a lot of drug taking in the movie because, as you say, right there, one of the first things that you say in the movie, you're an alcohol addict, cocaine addict, sex addict, weed addict, bulimia, prescription drugs, and we see all that. And you addressed this part of the film. I wondered if part of the wonderful nature of his creativity was all wrapped up in that. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, you know, he, and, and if you back off from that, then maybe you lose some of the creativity. Well, he expresses that doubt in the film. And I think it's definitely a question. It's a question that, that pops up a lot. You know, is there a correlation between self-destruction and being able to create things? And I would say there are plenty of examples that suggest yes. Whether that's a uniform fact, I don't know, I probably doubt that, but I would say, yeah, there's probably a correlation, I think. Just on the recording of the songs, you mentioned that you went and you recorded a couple of the tunes, which is how you appealed to the studio in the first place. 
as I understand it, you recorded all the, these 18 tracks, mm. but that increasingly as, as the film progressed, we hear a live take of your vocal. Take us to the set, tell us what happened. We employ different techniques, you know, it's, it's very trendy to say that you sang everything live. I can't speak to the validity of that in terms of other productions. We do some live and we do some not live. The technical demands and logistics of doing a number like Saturday Night's Alright for Fighting, which doesn't just include me, includes hundreds of dancers, extras, camera technicians, you know, a cinematographer, Dexter, and all of this rigging and paraphernalia. We sing along to a track, because otherwise you would completely lose control of everything. <laughs> now, for something like your song, which is a young man sat at a piano... It's a fabulous moment in the film. Thank you very much. I do that live, and I'm very proud of it, and I will claim it, because... It's true. And then there are sections of songs where I sing live. So Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, it starts live in the mirror. You know, there's bits of I'm Still I'm still Standing, everything in rehab was done live on set. So where possible, to try and achieve an authenticity of expression, it's sang live. But of course, my desire to do as much live doesn't trump the constraints of filmmaking. So not everything is live. Great relationship with Jamie Bell playing Bernie Torpey's terrific. And I, and I just want to mention Stephen Graham as it, Dick it's James. Fab, isn't it? Only because every, every, everything he's, he's involved with, he lights up. It's just I know. fantastic. He's got that wonderful gift as an actor. In the screening I was in the other day, he walked in and didn't say anything. You felt the audience's affection instantly because he just has that quality. It's an, it's an undefinable thing. Yeah. In my opinion, Rocket Man is a huge success. I, you know, uh, I loved it. As I said, I de went away and downloaded a whole bunch of songs afterwards. You must be thinking, okay, so what's next? Yeah, and I, and I genuinely don't know. I think it, in some respects it's tricky because it's afforded me so many opportunities. The music has been something that I've wanted to pursue for a while. But to have that coupled not only with a very complex character and the turbulent story filled with conflict, which is what you want, and a great arc, which is, you know, of paramount importance for any acting gig. It's been an incredible ride with people who have become such important people in my life. And I feel like inevitably there's a chance the next thing might not match up, but... I think a song and dance show with uh, Hugh Jackman is inevitable <laughs> at some I, stage. I, I, uh, where do I sign? I'm desperate for it to happen. He's, very, he's a very busy boy at the moment and who knows? Before too long, perhaps you'll see us in the same place again, but I would love for that to happen on a screen. Did you get to take anywhere, any, any of the outfits, did they say? You can have all these wonderful, incredible wardrobe that Elton has, which you, which you done, which would you take home? I have campaigned quite hard for the denim jacket from Tiny Dancer, which is sort of the one with all the patchwork. Uh, it's quite modest. Yeah, uh, uh, it is quite modest. It's pedestrian enough for me to actually use it, I think. And I'm told, I'm led to believe by the designer, Julian Day, that I'm getting it next week. Taryn Edgerton, congratulations. Thank you very Thank much, you, for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you.